Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming, hubby. <laughs> David Rowe is a painter and a sculptor. I know him mostly as a painter, whose work has been exhibited widely for many years, um, including at the Drawing Center, uh, John Good Gallery, Andre Emmerich Gallery, Von Lintel Gallery, all in New York, Gallery Thaddeus Ropak in Paris and Salzburg, Gallery Ascon Krohn in Hamburg, Fuji Gallery in Tokyo, Gallery Nusser and Bumgart in Munich, and many, many other places. His works are in the permanent collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. He's currently represented by Loretta Howard Gallery here in New York, Holly Johnson in Dallas, McLean Gallery in Houston, Von Barta Gallery in Basel, and I don't think that's a comprehensive list. Um, articles about David's work have appeared in all kinds of publications, Art Forum, Art in America, Art International, Art News, Art in Auction, Bomb, The New Yorker, and Le Monde, now we're going out to newspapers, New York Times, The Village Voice, The Washington Post, as well as many publications, too many to list, in Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. And we are very happy that he's been teaching here since 1996. Please join me in welcoming David Rowe. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, do I have a little light here? On the desk somewhere? No? I guess I can find my way through here. We're good. Um, so uh, I am going to start out by showing you the recent work so you know where I am now. And then um, we're going to move back in time to some early work. What I want to do is just talk about a, a few of the main ideas in the work and give you a look at uh, some of the work that I made in relationship to those ideas. Um, so this is an installation at Loretta Howard Gallery last spring here in New York, 26th Street. The um, show is called There and Back. Uh, the work is often large, physical, active surface. This is a detail of thingamajig, which was the uh, painting on the left in the last slide. Um, its relationship to the architecture and, and the space it's shown in is very important to me. Um, none of these shapes I'm working with now are really grounded in the architecture or the space. No edge of them is parallel or perpendicular to anything in the space. The only thing that's grounded in this body of work um, are the images. Uh, another view of the installation and the last view of the installation. Um, Gizmo is the one on the right. You're going to get a little bit of a view, better view of some of these. Um, concentric Blues is in the middle and Puka is on the left. Um, so I'll try to be concise. I have a fair number of slides to, to show you. Um, so I want to go back to a body of work that I think of as my first work, my work, where my work begins. But I also want to show you uh, someone who's a huge influence. You probably recognize this is a Brancusi, picture of Brancusi's studio. And um, the endless columns, there's three endless columns in the corner there. Uh, and here's one by itself. Uh, and Brancusi, obviously, like all artists, other artists, I'm influenced by all kinds of artists and all kinds of peers and so on. But, Brancusi has a very specific relationship to my work. Um, I don't know, I probably saw it in the late 60s, mid 60s for the first time, real, in the flesh. Um, and I liked the work, but it didn't really strike me the way later as it kind of percolated in my mind. Uh, I started to think about this idea of endlessness and the whole notion that he had about um, kind of extending the, the, what the viewer sees you know, beyond the actual finite art object. Um, and I really saw it as a, as a kind of an opening into uh, dealing with what was in the viewer's mind. So uh, this was enormously influential to me. And I started to make work that was really based on that. This is a, a helix. I chose a few forms that I thought were uh, you know, implied endlessness. I used a helix 
Um, I use columns. This one's directly ripped off from Brancusi, a kind of a skeletal version of his column. Um, and uh, bent ladders. This is a painting called Bias, uh, or other the columnar images. And then uh, concentric images. Uh, these are concentric ellipses and uh, expanding uh, chevrons superimposed on each other. Uh, we're starting around 1986. These are 86. Um, so the thing about the Brancusi and, and the way I wanted to use it was it, he introduces a kind of a mindset about the actual finite art object and its relationship to everything else and its images relationship to everything else. Um, and for me that was really interesting because what it did was it, it introduced the, what was in the viewer's mind into the, into the mix. Um, so uh, I had this idea about, about using uh, infinity, which is obviously a paradox. We can't conceive of infinity. It's a concept beyond conception. Um, you'll see as we move along that uh, this idea of paradox goes through the work um, really from beginning to end. It's still going on. Um, in terms of, of imagery, the kinds of imagery that I use, ellipses are, are something that I've used an awful lot. Um, and that's also something uh, that essentially has a, um, a paradox built into it. Uh, when you're looking at ellipse, an ellipse, you don't really necessarily know exactly what you're looking at right away. It could be a, a circle tipped in space, it could be a number, it could be a letter, it could be a mathematical figure. So the fact that it's kind of a slippery uh, image is something that, that uh, is very appealing to me. One of the things that kind of gives you a notion of, of an ellipse's uh, kind of koan-like quality is uh, one of the definitions of an ellipse is a circle with two centers, which obviously two centers, it's a paradox in itself. Um, the thing about paradox, or the, the idea of a situation that has no definite answer for me, one of the things that's really uh, interesting about it um, is that it opens up possibilities. It, it opens up, there's a kind of absurdity in it and there's a notion that, that there is no specific answer. Um, so uh, once I started to think about this idea of endlessness um, and the idea of the viewer uh, having a, a notion about the work in their mind, a kind of continuousness in their mind, I started to introduce gaps into the work. This is one of the first paintings that that introduced that, with the idea of, of specifically um, trying to, to make a really clear place, for an opening in the image for the viewer. Um, and this notion of the viewer finishing the image, for me, became uh, a major part of the work. So I started working um, with this idea of gaps, and then, you know, as the work progressed, I began working with panels. Um, uh, one of the things about, about uh, working in this way is that, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you that this last one may not be clear, is a, is a monochrome painting. It's only one color. This is not a very good slide because it looks like it's brown and black. But basically, it's just, um, uh, it's all the same color. It's all black, and it's a question of whether it's matte or, or glossy. Um, in any case, um, uh, as I started to work with this um, idea about, about gaps or the notion that you're not looking at the whole picture, um, uh, it really began to highlight the separation of the parts. Um, and, and the other thing it did is it, it introduced the idea of the distinction between the object and the image, that they were not the same thing. Um, so, uh, a lot of the images have, have openings. Um, they have places where the image is not finished, places where the viewer would finish the image. Um, this is a painting called Split Infinity that uh, was shown in a, a show curated by Mark Rosenthal at the Guggenheim and a show that traveled quite a bit. Um, it's another painting from that group, uh, homage to the Queen of Hearts. Um, basically an homage to de Kooning. Uh, but I, at this point, I had this idea about uh, 
kind of introducing color that was less formal. I had been really stripped down uh, monochrome or a single color in white or a single color in black or all black or all white. Um, and I started to kind of open that up. Um, the other thing that I got involved in was this notion of the, this is a fresco, by the way, pretty small, about 40 inches wide, um, was the idea that the image could be really, really huge and the panels that caught it could be actually really small. So that it's very hard to tell, in fact, what the larger image is. Um, so uh, the notion of highlighting the separation of the parts really begins to beg the question of, of wholeness. Um, so there's that first idea of, of endlessness or infinity. And the second idea that comes up is, this, is the relationship between part and whole. And uh, that started to move the panels apart. This is an installation view from, I think, 1990, John Good Gallery in New York City. Um, double negative, one of the paintings you just saw. And this other painting is called Theta. And what started to happen in the work was that the panels started to pull apart. Um, in this painting, all three panels have a completely different palette. Um, and it's composed of three mismatched ellipses. Um, so it became a kind, of, a kind of image of disconnectedness. And this idea about, about pulling it apart or seeing what happens um, if the parts are not obviously connected to the rest of the painting um, started to, to move a little bit faster. This is an installation from Tadeusz Ropak in Paris. Um, and the, the kind of main painting, this is, uh, who's afraid, this is basically, its title is, is a paraphrase of the uh, Barnett Newman painting, Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue, using the um, uh, cyan, magenta, using basically process colors. Um, but you can see here that the, the, the strategy in Theta is kind of full-blown. This whole body of work, none of the panels really have any direct relationship to the panels abutting them. Um, the other thing that started to happen in this work was that uh, they started to, to, panels started to be different depths. So the painting is fractured in terms of image, and it's also taking place on three different planes, or sometimes two planes, but often three planes. Um, there's a painting called Deep Focus from that, that same show. So uh, I started moving along with this idea, pushing this idea farther, and I started to use found materials. Um, and I began to basically push the work in two directions at this point. Um, one where it's a group of panels and they have a kind of tenuous relationship to an, uh, an incomplete whole or an unresolved whole. Um, and the other was the idea of, of accepting fragment as a kind of provisional whole. Um, in the sense that everything we see is a fragment of something. We don't really have a point of view where we can see infinity or we can see wholeness in any way. Um, so what I want to do, uh, talk about for a minute here before I go to the next slide, is I got involved in a book called Flatland. I don't know how many people know that book. It was a book written in the 19th century by Edwin Abbott. It's called a um, uh, satiric novella, I think is the way they talk about it. But it, it, it's an interesting book in that it happens on a lot of levels. It's a sociological critique of the structure of human society. Um, it's a fable or a kind of parable. And it's also a mathematician's investigation into dimension, which is really the part that interests me the most. Um, to give you an example about this, and I'll go to the next slide here. Um, there's a scene in the book where uh, the book is, is, is the narrative of a two-dimensional being in a two-dimensional world. And a scene happens where this two-dimensional being is in his world and he sees a dot on the horizon. And the dot starts to get, become a line which gets farther from the center in two directions, gets larger and larger and larger, and then it stops and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it becomes a dot, and it disappears. And the question is, 
from our point of view, in space land, as it's called in the book, what happened. And what happened was a sphere passed through his flat land. So what really um, excited me about this was the idea that how dramatically different the visual uh, evidence is based on what dimensional world you live in, whether it's 2, 3, 11, no matter what it is. Um, so at this point, I had a chance. I, I, uh, there was a dealer in Hamburg, Oskar Krona, um, now passed away, a uh, wonderful eccentric character. But he gave me a chance to, to take some of these ideas that I was really enamored of in Flatland and, and use them in the building where his gallery was. One thing I did was I put a huge black ellipse on the front, on the street side of his building. Uh, it was a white building. And presumably he got, got permission for it, but I don't think anybody else in the building was real happy about it. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a photograph of that. But he also, we also fabricated a number of steel pieces. And what I did with these was the, the, it was the idea of an imaginary ellipse passing through the entire building from top to bottom. Um, at about a 60 degree angle or a little less. Um, and the steel pieces would mark the places at which that part of the ellipse passed through the space. So I was directly using these ideas from, from Flatland. Um, but it was a negative, uh, the image was negative. So the image here is not, not the steel. It's, it's the space between the steel. Um, this, is a note, this is a 3D piece from that same show called Negative Monument, um, which is essentially a, a, um, a fragment of a negative space. Um, it's about four feet high, this piece. Um, so uh, you know, I worked with all these fragments, and, and I kind of got to the point of wondering, so, so you know, what happens if I just use the whole image? And obviously, I had some idea what was going to happen. Right away, what happens is that meaning and uh, subjective meaning and symbology start to come into this. Um, you know, what are we looking at? So there's a there's a, a different kind of fracturing, a kind of fracturing of meaning that happens. Um, and this is really the third main idea, which is kind of uh, related to the other ideas in the sense that again, the idea of representing zero or representing nothing um, is also paradoxical. Um, I want to go back. I don't know if you noticed. We had a little trouble in the beginning setting this up. Um, but one of the one of the uh, quotes that I had in the beginning, or, or statements I had in the beginning, was the idea that that abstract painting might show what can't be seen, which is kind of a credo for me, as you may have figured out. Um, this is a painting called Ground Zero. Uh, it's um, way before Ground Zero happened here, um, 92, 93, something like that. Uh, this is a group of paintings um, I referred to as double aughts. Um, and just to say a little bit about the zero idea or the nothingness idea and, and relationship to infinity. I studied tabla in India for a while. And um, when you do that in India, you, you, you study music with an instrument, but you also have to study um, the theory of tal. Tal is rhythm in India. Um, and in the process of that, I ran into two definitions. The, the definition of infinity, you know, Vedic definition of infinity, the word is purna. And it's defined as complete or total, um, which, which edges on the idea of finite. Um, and then the, the idea of zunya, which is zero, uh, is the sum of all distinct forms. So you've got these two opposing concepts that essentially come and meet each other um, and come full circle. It's another painting from that, nothing for John Cage. Um, some of these, this is a scanned image, so it's not a great image. But um, it's a large painting. The other painting was about six feet tall. This is about eight feet tall. So this motif. Um, I, it took me a while to shake this motif. I got kind of obsessed with it. This is about 18 months later or something. You can see it's kind of moving along. And you can also see it on kind of moving back toward fracturing. Um, it seems like a, a kind of um, inevitable thing for me. It's named Flatland, by the way, that painting. 
Um, this is a, I haven't mentioned printmaking. Printmaking actually, there's a, there's a kind of parallel body of prints for most of my work. Um, this is a lithograph uh, made at Tamarind. Uh, it was an ozone suite, it was called. Um, printmaking really has been uh, very influential for me, both in terms of kind of the quality of it and also the way prints are built. Um, and every medium obviously has its own thing and, and people have invented all kinds of ways to do it. But it made me a little bit more conceptual about how the, how the images were built. Um, also, uh, monoprinting, which you'll see in, in a little bit, uh, has been a really useful tool for me in terms of, as you probably know, it's basically just painting on a plate and printing it. Um, it reverses things. Uh, that's not much of an issue for me. Um, this is another part of that same ozone suite. Uh, so this is an installation at, at um, Andre Emmerich Gallery on 57th Street, 1996, I'm pretty sure. Um, and you can see the, the ellipse is still in there. There's a large, that main painting there is called Wind Pools Itself. Um, and it still has that large horizontal ellipse on the outside, but in the middle, uh, I started to take the ellipses and break them up and put them back together without me knowing how they were going to go. Just trying to find um, some unpredictable solution. So this idea about a, about a kind of eccentric um, uh, linear figure built out of these things became something I was quite interested in. Um, which uh, brings me to the, the next um, idea. Uh, which is chance. This is a small drawing, uh, 9 by 12, something like that, a very small piece of paper. Um, and what I did was, I'd always been interested in the random. I, I think artists are always, things happen in the studio randomly by chance. Um, and uh, it always seems better than something you can figure out yourself. Um, so I set up a simple system to uh, generate some, some visual qualities. Uh, there were nine constellations of points, nine different constellations of points. They're all interrelated, by the way. Um, nine uh, linear figures. This is the nine linear figures superimposed on each other. Um, the constellation of points, you see the dotted lines that hit the line. That shows you where a point is in, in the constellation of that particular group of points. Um, so there are nine constellation of points, nine curvilinear figures with corresponding flat shapes, um, and nine geometric forms with corresponding three-dimensional uh, forms. Um, so using this, this is a, a, a really large mural, which is a, I, I did down at the McKinney Avenue Contemporary in Dallas. Um, and again, it's simply, uh, the only difference here is that I allowed myself to kind of connect one linear figure to another. Um, but it was interesting, every time I did it, and every time I just kind of uh, superimposed them without really thinking about any kind of compositional thing, allowing them to just be what they were, um, they did a different thing every time. So that was, that was interesting. This is a, a painting on paper, 18 by 24, something like that, called Quanta. Um, and it was another one of those same groups of figures, obviously a, a kind of a blow up and not all of them there. Um, and this is a large painting, um, bigger than 8 by 10 feet, I'm not quite sure exactly what its dimensions are. It's called Moby Dick and it was kind of the final painting of this group, um, kind of the penultimate of this, this idea. Here's one of the, the um, beginnings of geometric, making geometric forms out of um, this chance system. So prints again, these are, these are prints using all those, kind of using different parts of those prints. Um, now you are starting to see some constellations superimposed in there. Um, these are made of paste prints, these are etchings, color etchings. Um, and here's one using these three-dimensional things. It, it, it's interesting working with things that um, are so kind of undefined. You know, you can take the points and you can make a form out of them. 
and then you can pull it inside out uh, and kind of see the other side of it. So they're pretty different every time you deal with them. So drawing, um, drawing is kind of huge for me. Uh, whenever I've, ever I've got a problem, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do. And I think about it, I realize I'm not drawing. Drawing is kind of like oil, or it's an engine. It, it, it keeps things going. So I'm just going to show you a few of these charcoal drawings that were, How large sorry? How large They're about 30 by 40. Um, pretty sure that's close. Um, so I started with these drawings with the idea of kind of trying to see what happens when curvilinear space and, and hard edge geometric space are, are conflated or, or superimposed. Um, you can see there are <coughs> same idea, different things. Sometimes putting the, the, the image in there smaller and kind of building it out. Um, but as I worked on these, I kind of got more and more interested, in, again, in the idea of seeing them in three dimensions and, and going back to some, some sculptural work. Um, and what happened was I, I started to, to work with resin by myself. And um, I think this is the next one is, yeah. Um, this is a small resin piece just on a, on a glass palette table in the studio with its reflection. Um, nothing but just sunlight. Anyway, I, I got involved in these. And, and what I found was that I was a terrible mold builder. Um, and I had a lot of disasters, and I wasted a lot of materials. And finally, I, I, I talked to somebody who knew a glass artist whose name is Linda Ross. And uh, Linda is a really amazing artist. She's made pieces for Kiki Smith and Robert Gober and a lot of other people. Um, and she was really great to work with. Uh, one of the things I haven't talked about is collaboration. And it's true with the prints, too. Um, when you do the kind of things that we do, I don't have a lot of studio assistants around. Um, it's really nice when you get to collaborate with people and work on things together. Uh, so we started working on these glass pieces. They're, they're cast glass. Um, and uh, she's the one who told me, you're a terrible mold builder. You should give that up completely. Um, and she put me in touch with somebody where I could put the drawings in, and he would make a, put it in a CAD program. And he'd make a CNC, and then he'd bring me the CNC, and we'd talk about it. And if there were changes, we'd make them. And, and when the CNC was right, then we'd build a mold and, and make a casting. Um, so uh, the blue one you just saw is here again. This is basically an addition. There are two editions of four um, three-dimensional glass pieces. Uh, the thing, th these really came directly out of the drawings. And, and I really think of them as a, as a kind of fusion of pure drawing and pure light. Um, which is a nice kind of sculptural idea. Another picture in the studio. Um, you can see the painting in the background. The, the paintings then, uh, you know, I started to work with, uh, in two dimensions, with, with shaped paintings, which is, which is where I am now, and, and uh, which is related to the, to the work you saw at the beginning. Um, and that's the painting in the background. Uh, it's a painting called Elector. It was just uh, up in, a, in, a, in its own little show down the Lower East Side. Um, and it was one of the earlier of these, these paintings. A painting called Ellipsis, the same, same time, same group of work. Um, this was in a show called Conceptual Abstraction at Hunter College. I don't know if anybody was around. It was a few years ago, 2012, I guess. Um, which was a reprise of a show at Sydney Janus Gallery in 92 or 93 called Conceptual Abstraction. And it was my generation, some of my generation of abstract painters. And uh, what they asked was for people to show a piece from the actual original show in the 90s and then a, and then a new piece. Um, it was an interesting show, actually. So the uh, split infinitive that you saw earlier was the other painting that I had in there with this. Um, this image, I, I, this painting was made, I think, 76, 75, maybe. Um, and it was really the first foray into shapedness. Um, 
and I really didn't know what to do with it at the time. I made about three or four of them and kind of went back to a rectangle and, and, and left it. But um, I think it kind of sat there in my mind. Um, so when I came around to these other shapes, it was a little bit like, like seeing an old friend. I kind of had an idea about, about um, dealing with that. Uh, and even though these are different from the, the kind of rectilinear based paintings, which were shaped in a way but built out of rectangles, um, they still have this idea about, about I mean, we, I think we're conditioned to see rectangles. Uh, so they have this sense of like what's taken away and how that um, both closes things down in one way and opens them up in another way. Um, but for me, what I really, what excites me about them uh, is that they have a much more dynamic relationship to the space and to the viewer um, than a rectangle does. Um, and they really kind of float in that space. Uh, so this is an installation down in uh, Houston, McLean Gallery. And this show had, you can see some glass pieces down there. Um, it had the charcoal drawings in it. It was kind of a comprehensive show of, of that whole body of work. Um, so monoprints, again, I, I, you know, they, they allow me to kind of play with all kinds of ideas and see what's going to happen. This is a monoprint from uh, Two Palms Press. Um, the shops I've worked with over the years that have been very consistent, Pace Prints, uh, Two Palms Press, um, Tamarind Institute, and uh, Omi Graphics. And it's, it's really nice to kind of keep that going over time. But the monoprints are probably the most influential in the work. Here's another monoprint from that um, group made after I started this shaped group. So we're kind of back to um, where we started, thingamajig. This was in one of those installation pictures. It's a big painting. Um, this is a new painting from this summer. It's called Cardinal Rule. It's not large. It's about five feet. Um, Gizmo, another one you saw in an installation. Maya. Just showing some, some of the paintings that I didn't show you before from this body of work. This is another painting. I, I, I kind of have some um, uh, studio pictures just for you to see things in the studio. Um, this was almost finished at this point. Uh, and here's some pictures from the studio with uh, some of the paintings from that show kind of on the floor and leaned up in the space. And that's it. Thank you. Question? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I mean, specifically, did you like the titles? Yeah, well, actually, I, you know, I did get into a thing with, with uh, there was whatchamacallit, and, you know, I kind of got into that little thing. But, uh, you know, titles, I, I found that, I think titles are really tricky. I, I think you can ruin a good piece with a bad title, but I don't think you can save a bad piece with a good title. So, uh, you know, they're, they're tricky, and I, I, I really like to have a good title. It's really interesting. I don't remember the untitled pieces as well as I remember the titled pieces. So there's something in that, you know, just a kind of recognition. Um, but I do want the title to be related to the image without trying to make anything didactic out of it, you know? Um, try to kind of introduce something to the work that wouldn't otherwise be there without, without stealing any thunder from the actual image. You know, I, I think ever since I started with those rectilinear based kind of shaped paintings, I began to see how difficult it was to put two paintings on one wall. And I just started to kind of thin out the installations. And uh, I do think, I mean, it was interesting this fall to do the, the show with one painting in it, because then you don't have any, you know, no, you know, you don't have any, I like that one better than that one. Uh, you just, just have, you know, take it or leave it. Um, 
but I think it's, uh, you know, I think of them as installations. I have a little story to tell. In, in, in Hamburg, before that sculpture show, I did a show of paintings. And it was the first show I'd done with this guy. And I got there, and he had hung the show. And I walked in, and I said, no, no, Oscar, this is terrible. I really don't like this. Um, and it was really bad for me to do that, because it was plaster walls. And so, you know, it was a big deal to change it. But in any case, I took them all down. I tried this, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this. Nothing looked good. I basically came back around to exactly what he had. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we have our thing. I mean, one of the things I guess I've learned as an artist is that I, I feel really strongly about the installation. I think it has a huge effect on how people experience the work. But you also have to respect that, that gallerists sometimes know the space better than you do. Um, but I, it's just, uh, you know, context is huge, you know, and the way something's installed is a big influence on how it's, how it's seen and interpreted. Oh, they are speaking to each other. Yeah, I start, I probably start, um, you know, five or six main paintings at the same time. And so they definitely speak to each other, and they're definitely ideas that go back and forth. Um, my process pretty much is, you know, I make some sketches to get some idea. I mean, I never make a specific study for a painting because I always find then when I get to the painting, I feel like I've already done it. So I like the idea that, that any preparatory work is just um, a possibility. Um, and so, it, you know, it, you might have 10 sketches and one painting may actually have all of those compositions, compositions in it, you know. You start with one, you think it's going to work, it doesn't. The second one, you think it's going to work, it doesn't, you know. Um, that whole thing about what happens when things get bigger. Uh, but um, basically, I, I think my process is pretty traditional in the sense that I, uh, I do use big templates. I probably have the world's largest collection of elliptical curves. <laughs> I've got them like 190 inches wide. Um, so I, I, I basically been doing this, and I, I, you know, I started them, this is really before I was using any kind of a computer, you know, the system where you put two nails in the floor and you put a loop on it and you make an ellipse. Um, and that was really nice. I really liked the kind of physicality of that. Um, since then, of course, some things are, are computer generated. Um, and the other thing is that those, those images get played with every single time you use them. So they kind of get, you know, I don't know how close they are to true ellipses at a certain point. Um, but, it, but my process is traditional in the sense that I, you know, I start putting something down just to see what it looks like. Um, and every day I scrape, if I'm not done with the painting, I scrape as much paint off it as I can because I don't want a big fat surface. I want a pretty thin, hard surface. Um, and I also want it to dry for the next day. And if you scrape it way, way down, it, in a day or two, it's dry. Color is something, you know, color is an infinite system, right? There are an infinite number of colors. Um, and I can't really conceptualize it, you know? I, I find that I just have to kind of see some things there and decide whether it's going to work or not. But I do start the paintings, I underpaint the paintings um, with a color just to put something down there. Um, so they all have underpainting, and, and as I'm scraping, that changes, you know? So what's underneath it changes. Color for me is a really uh, um, emotionally powerful thing. And I kind of try to keep it there. I don't try to conceptualize it, or, or I don't think about um, this body of work is going to be black in colors, or this body, you know. I just kind of try to follow my nose. I think it really, you know, surface is great. I, my surfaces are really kind of active, and there's a lot of stuff going on. But um, there's something where I want the image to, to be the first read and not the paint, you know? And the paint's there, and it's always kind of part of it, but um, I want that gestalt, that first gestalt to be really image-related. Well, you know, I started with that group, that kind of endless imagery stuff, and, and really, Brancusi saved my ass. You know, I was floundering around, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And, and it always kind of looked good, but it never hang, hung together, you know? I, did, I didn't have like a kind of consistent thing. 
Um, and once I kind of started that body of work, I, I kind of learned something about um, what I had to do to make sense of what I was doing, you know? Um, but to answer your question, I mean, I, I come from a musical family. Um, and uh, we lived in India for 12 years. And, uh, the, and I ended up studying Indian music just because, you know, uh, it was kind of there. Um, but, but that whole thing about tall and theory of tall, that became a kind of model for me. And I was pretty serious about that music, actually. I spent hundreds of hours practicing. Um, and it's interesting when I met my wife, she said, well, you spend all your time either painting or playing music. She said, you know, I'm here now. I don't think there's room for three. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I had a, I guess, I had a funny introduction to art. I, I really hardly had an art teacher I liked. Um, my, my first art teacher in, in undergraduate. I liked. Um, but it's funny that I persisted being an artist because I, I, I really got zero encouragement from all my teachers. <laughs> so before that, I, I mean, it really, honestly, I kind of was, I was looking, just looking, 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 you know. And there are hundreds of paintings, mostly thrown away. Calcutta. Calcutta was great at that time. Uh, the filmmaker Sajit Ray was working there. I don't know if people know his work. Um, Ali Akbar Khan was living there. Ravi Shankar was living there. All the great rhythm people were living there. I mean, it, actually, what's interesting is that it was really, we moved there in 63, and it was really close to Indian independence. And so, and particularly in Bengal, there was a renaissance of Bengali poetry and theater and painting and, so uh, Calcutta was a lot like New York. It was a real cultural kind of um, boiling thing. It was really happening. It was an incredibly exciting city. I mean, I traveled around India too, but I, but I spent almost most of my time in Calcutta. Been changing a lot. Been changing a lot. You know, I. Um, I saw a show at the Metropolitan called New York Painting 1940 to 1970 that Henry Geldzahler put together. And um, that was, you know, I had seen a lot of painting here and there, but that was the first big show of mostly abstract painting. It wasn't all abstract painting, but mostly abstract painting that I'd ever seen. And it was a huge influence on me. It was a huge influence on me in terms of being an abstract painter. Um, but it's interesting, you know, you have your heroes and you, you have, and they come from a different generation and they grew up in a different culture. Um, so uh, you start with this kind of romance about being influenced by them. But then, of course, the, the world moves on and it's a different ball game. Um, and I think for the generation right before me and my generation, the generation right after me, I think it was a really, um, kind of open situation. I mean, I remember when I first came to New York, early 70s, there weren't that many galleries. And there was a kind of an implicit and un, you know, a tacit um, thing about, about how you made your way in the art world, which was essentially to choose a sensibility from those galleries. Maybe it was Paula Cooper or somebody else. And Brown knows your way up until you got the show there, you know? And it seemed like a really, uh, claustrophobic system to me. Um, and what happened in the East Village days when, when all those, the, the kind of last grassroots art movement in this town, I think it had a huge effect on abstract painting. And for me, it just opened it up. And that was a point at which, uh, you know, I started to kind of think about Brancusi and some of those ideas. And um, uh, I think, you know, it, it the early New York school, all the painters were quite different. You know, I mean, it's really hard to think of, of de Kooning and Newman as being part of a school, you know. Um, and I think that's pretty true of, of the generations follow it, that it's really various, and everybody has different ideas about but what makes sense to do. Um, and I think for, for anybody interested in it, I mean, I think you, you have to make it up all over again, you know. I think it's pretty hard to have any kind of like
consistent thing. And in fact, you know, having just talked about India, I, I always thought it was interesting that you know you've got this thousands-year-old musical tradition, and obviously there's innovation all the time, but there's a kind of basis to it. Whereas in the West, we pretty much every generation tries to kill the generation before it. You know, so you don't have that continuity. Um, so I think it's a it's just a wide open thing, and I think it is right now too. But I think you know I also have to say I think you know I, I go around I see a lot of shows I see abstract painting now and I'm always interested in it. You know I am, and 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 sometimes I think you know like uh, what's her name Van Hyl Charlene Van Hyl is that her name? You know I went to see that show and and it really challenged some things that I that I believed for a long time and I thought yeah this is good. You know? So, I mean, it, it still has some life in it. I would say that's true. I would say that's true. I'm not um, a religious person at all, um, but there's something in that. And, you know, I grew up in the 60s, you know? <laughs> so, I, you know, what's the religion, you know? I mean, I have to say, you know, when I was talking about, about, about wholeness, and, and I saw a show the other night called uh, Neurons to Nirvana, and um, it was about the, you know, experience of LSD and other psychedelics on this notion of sensing wholeness, you know. Uh, and so I was really interested in that, like, you know, maybe part of this is, you know, goes back to that with me, you know, because I did participate in that. <laughs> I don't, I don't regret it a bit, but I do. Well, the only thing I can say about that is, I, I, you know, when I was a young abstract painter working in New York, um, illusion was like total no-no, you know? Anything that was about kind of seeing something, you know, and, and so it was obviously something I wanted to play with a little bit. And in that green painting, that's definitely there. I think it's there in the shapes a little bit too, you know, um, that they sometimes pop into a form. Um, so I mean, it, it, I don't, I guess, I don't rule out any thing that might happen as long as it makes sense to me, you know. So that aspect of opticality is there, it comes and goes a little bit. I have to say, I'm, I'm often more satisfied with a kind of um, direct physicality, even though that opticality sometimes does, does happen. Not as much as that, that previous group, but, but the, the shapes came out of that system. So, I mean, they were part of that, that system of chance. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I was used to, I remember having a conversation, I didn't know Elizabeth Murray well, but I remember having a conversation with her about whether or not she felt that once she'd ordered those shapes and had them, whether she was really stuck, whether it was, could be problematic. Um, and she kind of said, well, you know, I've done so many small paintings and studies and so on and so forth, I kind of know where I am. Um, and I don't know if that's the case with me. It, it certainly, once you have that shape, you have that shape, you know. Um, y y I have been tempted sometimes to take some of them apart and put different shapes together, which might happen. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that aspect, I mean, once it's there, it's there. And you've got to deal with it, you know. And that is, I mean, the thing about shapes, you know, like I said before, I, I like the fact that they're dynamic and they, they kind of have a... a um, uh, different relationship to the architecture, like a rectangle that's hung level uh, sits in the architecture, you know. There's a great story about Picasso going to his friend's houses where they had his work and he would always tip them unlevel. And somebody asked him, what are you doing? He said, well, they'll look at it. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm going to use that idea. Not really, not really. I think it just happens. I mean, you know, what I, to, to one other thing I might say about that is that when you've got a shape on a wall, particularly in the white box, you know, where you have this white, white wall, um, the negative space becomes super active, 
And that's a big issue for me, and it relates a little bit to this idea of gaps. Um, and if, if you hang two paintings where you get that sense that the two negative spaces are starting to interact, that's the point at which I have to kind of push them farther apart, you know. Uh, but I don't, the puzzle thing I don't, I don't really think about, but I, I know what you mean. Yeah, I'm just trying to. Like, space with your other paintings, uh -huh. Well, you can come down and do that. <laughs> Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, chevrons superimposed on each other. Uh, we're starting around 1986. These are 86. Um, so the thing about the Brancusi and, and the way I wanted to use it was it, he introduces a kind of a mindset about the actual finite art object and its relationship to everything else, and its image's relationship to everything else. Um, and for me, that was really interesting, because what it did was it, it introduced the, what was in the viewer's mind into the, into the mix. Um, so uh, I had this idea about, about using uh, infinity, which is obviously a paradox. We can't conceive of infinity. It's a concept beyond conception. Um, you'll see as we move along that uh, this idea of paradox goes through the work um, really from beginning to end. It's still going on. Um, in terms of, of imagery, the kinds of imagery that I use, ellipses are, are something that I've used an awful lot. Um, and that's also something uh, that essentially has a, um, a paradox built into it. Uh, when you're looking at ellipse, an ellipse, you don't really necessarily know exactly what you're looking at right away. It could be a, a circle tipped in space. It could be a number. It could be a letter. It could be a mathematical figure. So the fact that it's kind of a slippery uh, image is something that, that uh, is very appealing to me. One of the things that kind of gives you a notion of, of an ellipse's uh, kind of koan-like quality is uh, one of the definitions of an ellipse is a circle with two centers which obviously two centers, it's a paradox. In no? I guess I can find my way through here. We're good. Um, so uh, I am going to start out by showing you the recent work so you know where I am now. And then um, we're going to move back in time to some early work. What I want to do is just talk about a, a few of the main ideas in the work and give you a look at uh, some of the work that I made in relationship to those ideas. Um, so this is an installation at Loretta Howard Gallery last spring here in New York, 26th Street. Um, the show was called There and Back. Uh, the work is often large, physical, active surface. This is a detail of Thingamajig, which was the uh, painting on the left in the last slide. Um, its relationship to the architecture and, and the space it's shown in is very important to me. Um, none of these shapes I'm working with now are really grounded in the architecture or the space. No edge of them is parallel or perpendicular to anything in the space. The only thing that's grounded in this body of work um, are the images. Uh, another view of the installation and the last view of the installation. Um, Gizmo is the one on the right. You're going to get a little bit of a view, better view of some of these. Um, concentric Blues is in the middle, and Puka is on the left. Um, so I'll try to be concise. I have a fair number of slides to, to show you. Um, so I want to go back to a body of work that I think of as my first work, my work, where my work begins. But I also want to show. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming, hubby. <laughs> David Rowe is a painter and a sculptor. I know him mostly as a painter, whose work has been exhibited widely for many years, um, including at the Drawing Center, uh, John Good Gallery, Andre Emmerich Gallery, Von Lintel Gallery, all in New York, Gallery Thaddeus Ropak in Paris and Salzburg, Gallery Ascon Krohn in Hamburg, Fuji Gallery in Tokyo, Gallery Nusser and Bumgart in Munich, 
and many, many other places. His works are in the permanent collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego. He's currently represented by Loretta Howard Gallery here in New York, Holly Johnson in Dallas, McLean Gallery in Houston, Von Bartsch Gallery in Basel, and I don't think that's a comprehensive list. Um, articles about David's work have appeared in all kinds of publications, Art Forum, Art in America, Art International, Art News, Art in Auction, Bomb, The New Yorker, and Le Monde, now we're going on to newspapers, New York Times, The Village Voice, The Washington Post, as well as many publications, too many to list, in Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. And we are very happy that he's been teaching here since 1996. Please join me in welcoming David Rowe. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, do I have a little light here? On the desk, somewhere in itself. Um, the thing about paradox, or the, the idea of a situation that has no definite answer, for me, one of the things that's really uh, interesting about it um, is that it opens up possibilities. It, it opens up, there's a kind of absurdity in it, and there's a notion that, that there is no specific answer. Um, so uh, once I started to think about this idea of endlessness um, and the idea of the viewer uh, having a, a notion about the work in their mind, a kind of continuousness in their mind, I started to introduce gaps into the work. This is one of the first paintings that that introduced that, with the idea of, of specifically um, trying to, to make a really clear place, for an opening in the image for the viewer. Um, and this notion of the viewer finishing the image, for me, became uh, a major part of the work. So I started working um, with this idea of gaps, and then, you know, as the work progressed, I began working with panels. Um, uh, one of the things about, about uh, working in this way is that, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you that this last one may not be clear, is a, is a monochrome painting. It's only one color. This is not a very good slide because it looks like it's brown and black. But basically, it's just, um, uh, it's all the same color. It's all black, and it's a question of whether it's matte or, or glossy. Um, in any case, um, uh, as I started to work with this um, idea about, about gaps or the notion that you're not looking at the whole, you, uh, someone who's a huge influence, you probably recognize this is a Brancusi, picture of Brancusi's studio, and um, the endless columns, there's three endless columns in the corner there, uh, and here's one by itself. Uh, and Brancusi, Obviously, like all artists, other artists, I'm influenced by all kinds of artists and all kinds of peers and so on. But Brancusi has a very specific relationship to my work. Um, I don't know, I probably saw it in the late 60s, mid 60s for the first time, real, in the flesh. Um, and I liked the work, but it didn't really strike me the way later as it kind of percolated in my mind, uh, I started to think about this idea of endlessness and the whole notion that he had about um, kind of extending the, the, what the viewer sees you know, beyond the actual finite art object. Um, and I really saw it as a, as a kind of an opening into uh, dealing with what was in the viewer's mind. So, this was enormously influential to me, and I started to make work that was really based on that. This is a, a helix. I chose a few forms that I thought were, uh, you know, implied endlessness. I used a helix. Um, I used columns. This one's directly ripped off from Brancusi, a kind of a skeletal version of his column. Um, and uh, bent ladders. This is a painting called Bias, uh, or other, the columnar images, and then uh, concentric images. Uh, these are concentric ellipses and uh, expanding